Hello, 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 YouTube world. It's Miss Patty with For Your CNA, and I'm here for our weekly live question and answer session where I ask, answer all of your questions on CNA training and testing and workplace and whatever else you want to talk about today. So when you come in, if you can give me a quick hi in the chat, that way I know you guys are here and I can welcome you. Hello, Jorge. Hola. Um, so today uh, we're going to talk about, uh, for those of you who don't know, I always give a little lesson during the question and answer sessions. And this is, um, you know, while you guys are coming in and getting settled and uh, gives you an opportunity to learn a few things. Um, so today's topic is actually going to be on documentation principles. And um, this is a really important lesson. So this is one of those things that most people kind of, kind of their eyes glaze over and they're like, oh, documentation. I don't want to talk about that. But it really is very important. So I want to um, present this information because it may actually save you a lot of grief later. So we're going to get into documentation principles. Hello, x -teen. Hello, Blundie. Thanks for joining me today. Some new names today. Super exciting. So while I'm doing this lesson, if you have a question, drop it in the chat and we'll get to it in just a few minutes. Stay tuned to the very end and we do our congratulations to all the people who passed the test this week, dropped out by our channel and let us know. So we'll give some congratulations shout outs at the end of today, uh, at the end of the lesson today. But I do want to uh, remind you and I'll remind you again at the end too, that next week we will not have a live lesson. So next Thursday, I won't be here live, mark your calendars, um, because I'm actually going to be at a YouTube conference out in Texas. So I'm super excited about this. I will go live sometime, either Wednesday or Thursday from the conference so that I can bring you guys along for the ride and you can kind of see what the conference is like and, and uh, all the people that are there. And this is my first time going I am super nervous, guys. I am. I really am. I'm like on pins and needles about this. Um, I'm really hoping that I make some good contacts and um, some people there will kind of help me out with some of the challenges that I'm having. So we'll see how it goes. I'm excited, but I'm very nervous, too. So uh, keep me in your thoughts next week. Like I said, I will go live sometime either Wednesday or Thursday. I'm not sure when the schedule is going to permit me to. And um, if you haven't subscribed to our channel and that's something that interests you, go ahead and subscribe and hit the bell notification. If you do that, when I go live, YouTube will let you know and you can hop on and, and see it live. So if you have a chance, if you have a chance... Um, subscribe and ring the bell so that uh, you can join me next week on that conference. So it's going to be really, really exciting. Um, all right. So let's get into today's lesson. And I'll remind you all that of the uh, at the end of today's lesson. So let's get into today's lesson. So today we're talking about documentation principles. And this is really just... Um, just general guidelines doesn't really matter what you're documenting or where you're documenting it. Medical documentation has some very basic fundamental guidelines that everybody has to follow. And that's what we're going to get into. But first, I want to tell you a little bit about what documentation is. Okay. Documentation in a medical setting is actually a legal record of the care that was provided to that patient and how they responded to that care. Now, our overreaching guiding principle here is if it wasn't documented, it wasn't done. So that's a really important principle. And a lot this trips up a lot of people. Most of the time when documentation is called into court and there's a problem with it, it's because of this. So someone um, would say, well, yeah, I did that. And the lawyer would say, yeah, but it's not here. How do we know you did it? Now you're telling us you did it, but can we really believe you? If you really did it, it would be here. So in a court, at the time that they're requesting these records, they're going through discovery, they're going through depositions, they're getting ready for the court case. When all of that is going on, 
if it isn't in the documentation at that time, when, when they're pulling these records, when they get these records from, you know, the medical establishment and they look at it, if there's nothing written there, then that means to the legal system, it wasn't done. And no matter how much you say, but I did it, I did it, I know I did it, I did it, I did it, they're not going to believe you. So the legal principle here is if it isn't documented, it wasn't done and you can't go back in time. So we have to understand this when we're documenting. It actually becomes a really, really big deal, um, even for CNAs. So, and lawyers, they're not nice people. <laughs> they are not nice people when they are trying to prove a case and they have no problem at all dragging you through the mud if it's going to mean a victory for their client. So we've got to make sure that we understand which side of the equation we're on here and make sure that we cover ourselves appropriately as well as our employer. Um, so we're going to go over a couple of strategies for documentation that's going to help us with this. But before I talk about documentation for CNAs, let's review some documentation um, that you may that that we kind of think about when we're talking about medical documentation that doesn't actually affect us. See, there's lots of different types of documentation in medicine. And there's um, long form narrative, there's uh, precise formulas, there's checkoff lists, there's all kinds of stuff, all kinds of ways of documenting what's happening with the patient. And it really depends on what type of healthcare worker you are as to what kind of documentation you'll be required to do. So different modalities have different documentation requirements. So when we're talking about doctors, now doctors usually don't sit down and write anything out. Have you seen a doctor's handwriting? If they wrote it out, nobody would be able to read it. Doctors, for the most part, transcribe their uh, or uh, dictate, I'm sorry, they dictate their documentation, their notes. And then somebody somewhere types all that in and transcribes it into print. So for doctors, usually a lot of their documentation is going to be dictation, verbal, and somebody else is going to transcribe it. Um, now we have computer programs that are really, really good at understanding voices and transcribing as the doctors dictate. So that used to be a whole medical career medical transcription. Somebody just has earphones on, listens to what the doctors say and types it in. Now we have AI for that. So medical transcription really is kind of going by the wayside. There's no real need for it anymore. There are still a few around, but for the most part, it's going to be done by um, a computer system now. So doctors usually aren't writing a whole lot out. But their documentation is going to uh, center around diagnosis and treatment of specific conditions. So they're problem focused, right? Problem and solution focused. That's not us. Now, nurses, on the other hand, their documentation is going to be different from the doctor's. Nursing documentation is called progress notes, and it's going to center on how the patient responded to the treatments and um, what we're doing with them. So doctor documentation is problem and solution focused. Nurse documentation is going to be how the patient reacted. So patient focused. So doctor problem and solution focused, nurse patient focused. Now, nursing documentation's different in that it often will follow a formula. Now, nurses can do what we call long form narrative documentation. When I first started in nursing, this is what we did. Narrative, we told a story with our words. We wrote everything down and an assessment, a head to toe assessment on a patient could take up three or four pages of documentation if it was thorough. So long form documentation, I mean, 
narrative is called narrative charting, it can take up like a whole book. But a lot of that is going to be, yeah, the digestion system was fine. The respiratory system was fine. You know, I mean, within normal limits, we don't use the word fine within normal limits, but it was a lot of space, a lot of words, basically to say no problem here. So they realized after a while, this was taking up a lot of time on the nurse's part to really say nothing. So they came up with some formulas that nurses could use to um, document specific problems or um, responses that they see in the patient. Now, there's a lot of different ones, right? The, the first one that comes to mind is CBE, which is charting by exception. Charting by exception just means that, yeah, we assume everything is fine with that patient, except for the things that we're going to note here, right? So we're not writing all that stuff out, long form, lots of words to say nothing. So charting by exception just means, yeah, if it's not on this, it was fine. We're going to tell you what we see is wrong with the patient. Now, that was one of the first forms of um, what we call formula-based documentation for nurses. And then came soap notes. <laughs> soap goes on to be soapier. That's subjective, objective, assessment, and plan. That's what SOAP means. Subjective, what did we, or what did the patient report? Objective, what did we see that corroborates what the patient report reported? A, uh, the assessment, you know, what did we discover that supports all that? And then plan, what are we going to do? You know, what, what, what is the plan? Are we going to notify the doctor? Are we going to, you know, what is the plan here? We're going to turn and reposition the patient every two hours. What is the plan? They went on to add three more letters to the end and called it soapier. <laughs> These people, I don't, I, I'm not real sure. But um, the IER is intervention. So what do we do about that? Evaluation, how did the patient react to it? And then revision or reassessment. So um, what do we need to do moving forward, right? So soapier was one of the first formula-based um, types of charting. Now, that's a whole lot of charting. Subjective, objective, assessment, plan, intervention, evaluation, revision. Oh my goodness, this is a lot of stuff. And it wasn't always relevant. We might see that there's a red spot on the patient's backside, but the patient didn't re you know, report anything. So the subjective is just not there. So it really, it was... It was better than narrative, but it was still very wordy, right? So then they came up with things like DAR or PIE. So PI just kind of cuts to the chase. What is the problem? A problem might be subjective, might be objective, but what is the problem? What is our intervention? What are we going to do about the problem? And what is the evaluation? When are we going to follow up? How do we know that our intervention was successful, right? And DAR is the same thing, just different words. So um, data, analysis, and response. So these are all just different formulas to come to the same conclusion. We saw something, we're going to do something, this is our plan, and we did something, this is how the patient responded. Depending on where the nurse works, they'll discover what type of documentation is required for that place. But that's not really a CNA thing. We don't do all of that, thankfully. Um, we do, CNAs do more basic documentation. And in fact, in a lot of places, CNAs aren't allowed to document with words at all. CNAs use checkoff sheets and they will put numbers into predefined spaces like vital signs or intake and output or food percentages or those types of things. But they, in most places, CNAs are not allowed to use words because words are what's going to be held against you in court. 
And CNAs just don't have the um, assessment skills or the documentation skills to use words without getting themselves or their facility in trouble. So we need to understand that there's different types of documentation for each different modality. And the type of documentation we are going to do is going to depend in a large part on the legal liability for each stage. Okay. So we know that medical documentation is a legal form. We already know that. And that everything that you document can be used in a court of law. So when you document, there's some principles there that you need to be aware of. When you are documenting, you are swearing. It is just like in a court when you put your hand on the Bible, put your hand on the Bible and put your hand up and you swear that everything in this documentation is true and correct to the best of your knowledge. When you document and you sign it, that's exactly what you're doing because it's a legal form. It wasn't um, practical to have every documentation form notarized, right? That's just not practical in a healthcare setting. But when you sign your documentation, that is what you are attesting to. Everything in here is true and correct to the best of my knowledge. I was the one that did the, the task. This is what I saw, or this is everything in there is correct. So you're not, um, you're not fudging anything here. Important to know. Okay. Important to know. So to keep us out of trouble, we have to have a way of documenting that makes sense. Okay. So all of these other big long form documentations, they're wordy. They take a lot of time. They may not be always, they may not always tell the whole story. So a long time ago, somebody came up with this brilliant, simple principle about medical documentation called the ABCs. Now, I have no idea who to credit for this. I don't know. I looked into it. I couldn't find who originally came up with this. But this really is the forms the basis of all medical documentation. Does not matter if you're doing a checkoff form, if you're putting numbers in a box, if you're writing big words, or if you're dictating something. This right here is what's going to form the basis of all of that documentation. And it's the ABCs. It's called accurate, brief, and complete. So let's go through each one of these really quickly. So A is for accurate. Well, that just makes sense. We want to make sure that what we're saying is the truth. It's accurate. Um, we can get off track here pretty easily, though, especially if we start bringing in things like I think. Or um, we start diagnosing using our words. We've got to be really, really careful here. So when it comes to accuracy, we want to make sure we're documenting the right thing on the right patient at the right time. And we're making sure that we're not adding in things that may or may not be relevant or outside of our scope of practice. So let me give you an example here. So let's say that you are a CNA and your facility allows you to document in words. Not very many do, but let's say that yours does. And you notice that your patient is not drinking a whole lot today. And when they urinated, it was dark brown in color. So you document this because you want to document appropriately. So you sit down, you start to document this. And you put in that the patient hasn't had much to drink today. I think they're dehydrated. Um, they're complaining uh, that, you know, that their stomach hurts and the urine was dark. And I really think that they're dehydrated. So I'm going to tell the nurse that I think we need to put more fluids in. That's not how we document. There's a lot of I in there. And I statements are what really get us into trouble in medical documentation because that takes the focus off the patient and puts it onto you. And we really have no bearing in this. So a better way to document that would be noticed decreased oral intake, 
urine dark in color, patient complains of abdominal pain, nurse notified. Notice that in there, there was no I statement at all. It wasn't about me. It was about the patient and it was accurate. Everything that I said earlier was in there, but this is where the B comes in. B is brief. So we took that whole big long, I noticed that the patient wasn't drinking a whole lot. I think he's dehydrated. Um, when he went to the bathroom, he didn't have much urine and it was brown and he complained his stomach. I took all of that and condensed it down into something that was much more to the point. So brief. We want to be brief because somebody's going to have to read this at some point. And spoiler alert, that somebody is probably going to be you. So the trick, I'm going to get to that in a minute. Hold up. The trick here is to be accurate and keep it brief while making sure that everything that we give is complete because we're writing this documentation because we're not the only ones taking care of this patient. There's a whole team of people here that are taking care of this patient and we want them to know everything that we know. We want the whole story. So we want to be accurate, tell exactly what's going on, but we want to keep it brief. Now, while we're keeping it brief, we've got to be very careful not to leave out relevant details because we want it to be complete. So these three words, accurate, brief, and complete, they may seem like very simple terms, but they actually, each one of them packs a bigger punch, especially when you put it all together. So now we got to talk about why are we even documenting? Why do we have to document? Well, we have to document because this patient is being cared for by a whole bunch of people, different modalities. So doctors and nurses and CNAs and dietary and therapists and social workers and all kinds of people. And we want to make sure that we're passing information between team members that's relevant so that if you know, if all of that happened, the dietitian needs to be aware of that because maybe they uh, have something going on that can be addressed from a dietary standpoint. We also want to make sure that the social worker knows about that because if this patient is going to be discharged home, they may not drink very well left to their own devices. The nurse needs to know that because yes, the patient may be dehydrated, but they may also have kidney failure or some sort of abdominal problem, or liver failure. So there's a lot of things going on that these symptoms may suggest. And yes, the doctor needs to be aware of it too, so that they know what tests to order, what diagnostic imaging, what blood work, you know, how do we get to the bottom of what's wrong with the patient. So we want to be accurate, we want to be brief, and we want to be complete so the entire team knows what we're doing. But there's another aspect of this. Because lawsuits don't happen right away. Lawsuits in general take about three to five years before depositions occur. Okay. So when you are writing documentation, what you're actually doing, yes, you're keeping the entire team informed of everything that you did, that you noticed that's going on with this patient. You're keeping them all, all informed. But what you're also doing is leaving a note for your future self, because if you get called in for a deposition, you're not going to remember what you did on this Thursday at three o'clock three years from now. You're going to have no idea. I can't tell you what I did in the third Thursday of September in 2020. I can't tell you where I was or what I did. I certainly can't tell you that this patient, this one patient out of the 40 that I'm working with today, this one patient wasn't drinking a lot, had dark urine and complained of stomach pain. I have, I'm not going to remember that three to five years from now. So when I'm documenting, I'm actually leaving my future self that is in a deposition, a note. 
saying, this is what you saw. This is what you did. And this is what we need to do. So when you're documenting, you're leaving information for the entire team, but you're also making sure that your future self can read that and know exactly what was going on so that you can answer the questions accordingly. Does that make sense? So we want to be accurate. We want to be brief, no long words that don't mean anything, but we want to be complete because your future self is depending on you documenting correctly to give you a clue on what to say in that deposition. Does that make sense? I hope that makes sense. So a lot of our uh, documentation now is electronic. So there was a, a move back in 96 to make all documentation electronic. And we made really good strides there. Um, very, very, very few places are still doing handwritten notes. Most everything is electronic now. But being electronic, that means that you're probably going to need some basic computer skills. You've got to know how to work a mouse. You've got to know how to get into the, the computer interface. You've got to remember your login information. So wherever you go uh, to work, they're going to train you on this. We'll get into that in just a second. But electronic documentation is going to, it's very informative, okay? It documents not only who is documenting, because you have to sign in, you've got to log in. So all your documentation is under your login. But it also tells us when they documented. So if somebody goes in three days later and documents that they did something three days earlier, hmm, that's kind of a red flag. Yeah, you may have forgotten to document three days earlier and you're doing a late entry, but do you really remember everything you think you do from three days ago? So it, it's going to keep track of not only who is documenting, but when that documentation occurs. And it's also going to handle errors differently than we handle them with paper documentation. So with electronic documentation, if you have an error, if you document the wrong thing on the wrong patient, then it keeps all that information in there. It just shows it as a documentation error, but it wasn't destroyed. It stays in there. So you've got to have a very high level of attention when it comes to electronic documentation. Now, the old fashioned way is paper. Paper documentation is simple. It's pen and paper. And uh, sometimes it's just a box for you to fill in a number. Sometimes it's a checklist. Sometimes it's words, but it's paper. Now, there's some rules we have to follow with paper documentation. Some of those rules are we have to use a pen and most places require black ink pens, not purple, not blue, not pink, not green, not red, black ink pens. You'll want to check with your facility about your documentation requirements. But no matter where you are with paper documentation or what color you have to use, never, ever, ever, ever destroy documentation or use whiteout or erase something. That shows that you're hiding something. And in medicine, we don't ever hide anything. So we don't erase, we don't white out, we don't destroy, we don't do any of that. We're going to handle the error, errors correctly. And I'm going to show you how to do that in just a second. But probably the most important thing here is not to pre-document. Post-documenting is not good either, but pre-especially. And let me give you a story for this. Years ago, I was a hospice case manager and there was a CNA um, at the bedside of a dying patient. So the patient had no family. They lived alone. There was a CNA at the bedside and the CNA was required to document every 15 minutes how the patient was. Okay. So um, this is, it's a long night. It's an overnight shift. You get sleepy and this CNA was trying to stay awake. So the patient was very stable all night long, every 15 minutes, resting comfortably, eyes closed, no signs of distress, resting comfortably, eyes closed, no signs of distress, resting comfortably, eyes closed, no sign of distress. So this was every 15 minutes for the last several hours. 
Well, she was bored and she was sleepy and she wasn't using the best judgment. And so for the next two hours, she just went ahead and pre-documented patient resting comfortably, no signs of distress, you know, so she documented for the next like two or three hours ahead. Well, the patient died in that time frame. So now as the hospice nurse responding to that death, I have a medical legal document that's telling me at 4 15 AM, the patient was resting comfortably, no signs of distress. And here it is, 3.30 in the morning, and the patient is dead. So I've got a legal form that says that they were alive 45 minutes from now. How, how can that be? And remember, you can't destroy documentation. You can't white it out. You can't alter it. I mean, what, what do we do here? So she pre-documented which is something that we're not ever allowed to do. And it made the legal record wrong. That's a really, really big deal. Very big deal. So, of course, I had to report it to the office and they had to remediate her and explain to her all about documentation. And she had to take a class and it was a really big deal. This is a legal form. It is not a no big deal issue. This is a really big deal. Okay. So be careful there. Don't pre-document. If we have an error on paper documentation, all we're going to do is draw, draw one single line through it. We're going to write error above it with our initials. And then we want to indicate why it was an error. Did I document on the wrong patient? Guys, I have done that so many times in my career. I pick up a chart. I get distracted by uh, something that's happening. I come back to chart and I chart the information from patient A in the chart for patient B. Oh, no. So you just write a line through it, write error above it in your initials and wrong chart or wrong patient or wrong value or whatever it is. But we don't ever destroy documentation, use whiteout or erase anything. Does that make sense? So for you as a CNA, there's some principles here you need to know. First of all, don't ever document for somebody else. If you document something, it says you did it, you. Remember, this is a legal form. Hand up. I swear and attest that this is the truth. If you didn't do it, you can't document it. And this happens way more often than I would like to, to even discuss. Somebody's getting ready to leave work. They realize they didn't document their eyes and nose. They tell the next shift, hey, can you document my eyes and nose for me? I got to go. No, I can't. I'm sorry, but I can't. Because I didn't do the work. I can't document that I did. So don't, even though you may be the nicest person in the world and you really want to help somebody out, you are violating a legal principle. You cannot document for somebody else. You want to make sure you're documenting at the right time. You document something when you do it, not before you do it, and certainly not days later. You want to document when you do something. Make sure you're limiting those use of I statements. We don't care about you. We care about the patient. So I think, I saw, I heard, I told. That puts the focus on you, not the patient. So limit those use of I statements. When we're documenting also, you know, it's got to be, the focus has got to be on the patient, but be really, really careful that you don't sneak in your own assumptions. So this happens a lot, unfortunately. I think the patient is dehydrated. Well, you can think that all you want, but that's not a medical diagnosis because you're not a doctor. And if you put it in there, it makes it sound like a medical diagnosis and you're not a doctor. So we've got to be careful not to put in things that we think, that we feel, that we, um, it, it's just, it's not our scope of practice. We can put in things that we see, that we hear, and even that we feel or smell, but not what we think. So skin felt warm to the touch. That's okay. But 
I think the patient has an, a surgical site infection because the skin is red and warm, that is not okay. Okay. Incision site warm to the touch and red. That's okay. So we got to make sure that we're wording this appropriately. Make sure we're focusing on that patient, what we see, what we hear, what we smell, what we feel on that patient. Focus should be on them. Make sure you're staying in your scope of practice, right? We don't diagnose anything. And this is one of the reasons that CNAs don't use a lot of words and documentation because they can get you in trouble pretty quick. Because the way that we communicate uh, through writing, especially now in the text era, uh, the way that we communicate with others in writing is different than what's required for medical documentation. So wherever you go to work, doesn't matter where it is, wherever you go to work, you're going to be trained on their documentation system. And it's important that you pay attention here. Um, you know, during orientation, you're going to be told where to park, how to clock in, who your supervisor is, how to sign up for insurance, all of those types of things. But this is part of orientation too. finding out how you're supposed to document at this facility, what the requirements are, what the legal aspects are. Are you allowed to use words or not? Um, what your login information is for any electronic documentation that you need to do, how to use that system properly. All of that's going to be covered during orientation. And you want to make sure that you truly understand this before you get out there and start working. So pay attention to that. So yeah, medical documentation is part of every CNA job because somebody has to know what we've done. They also have to know what we've seen. Don't document that you gave a shower if you didn't actually give the shower. Don't document that you fed a patient if they refuse to eat. We want to make sure that the documentation is accurate. We want to make sure it's brief. We're not giving a lot of unnecessary details. Today for lunch, they had mashed potatoes and meatloaf. In the patient, only ate 50%. Well, we don't need to know what the diet was. We just need to know patient only ate 50%. So make sure you're brief. But be complete as well. If there's details in there that the other team members need to know, make sure you're including them. Accurate, brief, and complete. That's what forms the basis of all of our medical documentation. It's important that we understand that and that we apply it to the documentation that we are going to be doing as we go through our careers. So I hope that helped you guys. I hope that helped. So let's see here. Yep, we're on social media. <laughs> let's see who's here, guys. Uh, let's see. Hello, Miss Patty. Hope the whole family is doing good. Wish you a blessed weekend. Thanks a lot for everything. Thank you, Helen. You're so sweet. Uh, we're doing fine. We are doing fantastic. I'm super excited about going out to Texas for the conference. A little nervous. I'm not going to lie. A little nervous. This is the big leagues. Um, but uh, make sure that you... Um, you ring the bell so that when I go live from the conference, you guys can jump in and see it. Hello, Jennifer. Debbie says, when doing catheter care, is it okay to fix the resident's clothing with my gloved hands after completing the skill? So the answer to that is a little bit complex, right? If you, if you go watch my video, you'll see that when I put the privacy blanket over the patient, I roll the gown and the blanket underneath. And when I do that, right, the gown and the blanket. So if I have, if I have the gown and I have the blanket, right, and I roll them underneath like this to expose the patient, oops, to expose the patient. And then I do my work here, right? I clean the catheter, I clean the peri area. When I unroll that blanket, it unrolls the gown. And that way I'm not actually having to touch that gown with my soiled gloves. It's just, you know, that's not, I, I wouldn't want somebody to touch that gown with soiled gloves if it were me. So this is a way of getting around that. Now we do want the patient covered. So if you have no other option, then yes, pull the gown down with your soiled gloves, but don't touch that sheet that's going to go right up next to their face with us, those soiled gloves. Don't do that. So yes, you can, but there is a better way. Go watch my video and it will help you with that. It'll help you learn that. 
Jennifer says, so last week I asked about HIPAA and the room number. I guess what I was asking is when you give out a patient's room number, you're admitting they're there. Isn't that breaking confidentiality? It's a great question, Jennifer. So the answer to that is it really depends on the facility that you're at. So if you're in a hospital during the admission process of the hospital, they're actually going to ask you if you want others to know that you're there. And that's part of the admissions process. So if if the patient says, yeah, that's fine. I don't have a problem with that. Then it will go into the system. If the patient says, no, I don't want anybody to know I'm here. I fear for my life. I've got this ex-husband who's trying to kill me. That's why I'm here. I don't want anybody to know I'm here. Well, there's a box that they check in the system that flags it. And it actually keeps the patient's name from displaying downstairs. Remember, in, in any hospital, you have to be checked in downstairs as a visitor before you can go up to see the patient. So their name won't show up. It'll actually be coded out. So anybody that answers the phone, anybody that uh, shows up to visit, um, if the patient has consented, their room number and name will be available. If they haven't consented, it, it just won't show up. Nobody other than the treatment team is going to know who that patient is. Mental health is a little bit different. Mental health, we actually um, approach us from the other side of it. We don't release anything unless the patient specifically tells us we can. So uh, acute care hospitals is usually defaulting to, yeah, we can release uh, room numbers, but unless the patient doesn't want it, we're going to ask. Mental health, it's usually the other way around. We don't release anything until the patient actually tells us to. So it depends on what setting you're in. Now, residential settings where the patient lives, that's a little bit different. Wherever the patient lives, where nursing homes or assisted living facility, that's their home. So yes, um, in most cases, the default is, yeah, they live here. Sure. So it really depends on the setting that you're in. Good morning, Gemma. Uh, Jennifer Lynn says, hi, Patty. I took my CNA exam today. I passed the clinical portion. Your videos help so much, but I have to retake the written. Any advice before I retake? Yes, Jennifer. Oh, my goodness. So congratulations, congratulations, congratulations on passing the skills. Great job. We are super proud of you. Now, if you go to our website, foryourcna.com, Hold on, let me type this in for you. For your, whoops, I can't type. <laughs> slash ebook. There we go. For your cna.com slash ebook. Oh, I actually had it here. I'm sorry. There we go. Um, so go to that website. We finally got the um the form working. So if, if any of you tried to get the ebook and you got an error, it wouldn't go through. It's working now. Yay. I'm so excited. So yes, go get the ebook. The ebook will help you tremendously with the written exam. And uh, we've had lots of people that failed the written, read the ebook and said, oh my gosh, this is exactly, the, this is the missing piece. And then they were able to go on and pass the, the written exam with no problem. So make sure you go get that ebook. It's free. It's free. All you got to do is request it and it'll get sent to your email, download it and open it. So um, good luck to you. Uh, Jennifer Lynn says, I'm a transitions volunteer with hospital uh, hospice. Awesome. That's such a rewarding um, service that you're providing. So thank you so much for your service. Debbie says, thanks for answering. Tomorrow is my day for the state exam. Wish me luck. Oh, Debbie, good luck to you. Great vibes out you, your way. We know you're going to do fantastic. And stop by and let us know. Because if you put a comment on any one of my videos, a fresh comment, don't reply to somebody else. I don't always see those replies. But put a fresh comment on any one of my videos. Let me know that you passed. And then... In two weeks, when I go live again, I'll be happy to send you a shout out for passing the state exam. Remember, I'm not doing a live next week. But if uh, anybody else, if you pass the state exam, come back and let me know on any of my videos so we can send you a congratulations and welcome you into healthcare. All right. So Jennifer says we'll do. Great job. Are there any other questions for me today? Any other questions? 
If not, we're going to get into my favorite part of today's lesson, and that's the congratulations. So let's see who we're going to congratulate today. So let's see here. Let's congratulate those who just passed the exam. Ready? Andrea Edwards, 8969. Congratulations to you. Angela Spencer, 0573. Great job. Cordella Cowell, 5576. Fantastic work. User JU4VM6 NF5D. Congratulations to you. Uh, Kedwin John Carlos, John Carlos, congratulations. Uh, and welcome to the wonderful world of healthcare for all of you. Um, congratulations also to, um, wait a minute, who just told me? Oh, I've lost, hold on a minute. I know one of you guys just told me. Uh, Jennifer Lynn, there it is. Congratulations to Jennifer Lynn as well for passing the, um, the skills portion. So let's move on to who's testing soon. Julia Fleming is testing soon. Of course, Jennifer Lynn will take her written test as well. And uh, congr or to great vibes out to both of you. You're going to do fantastic. Come back and let us know how you do. We also have uh, Debbie Virgo, who's testing tomorrow. And I'm sorry I didn't have you to put in here, but great vibes out to you. You're going to do great. We have a couple people that are awaiting results. So these are people that took their test. They're just waiting to find out whether they passed or not. Uh, so J Lingas Bingo, 2455. And Jovia Praise, 7928. So both of you, we're going to keep our fingers crossed and some good vibes out your way as well. Please let us know your results when you get them so that we can either help you on your next attempt or congratulate you on a job well done. So um, this is my favorite part of what I get to do every week. So please remember, I will not be here next Thursday. I am going to be in Texas at a conference, but I will go live at some point and let you know Everything that I know, everything that I see or hear, it'll be a fun one. Not scripted, no slides. It's just me and you. And I'm really looking forward to that. Um, so make sure that you ring that bell if you want to be notified. And I'll be back here in two weeks with uh, another live weekly lesson. And Monday, we're graduating a class out. So if you want to pick up some interview tips... Monday would be a good live lesson to a uh, live classroom lesson to sit in on. Um, I'm going to tell you how to answer that question. Tell me a little bit about yourself. That's always the one that stumps everybody, isn't it? So I'm going to give you a formula to follow to answer that question. So if that's going to help you, make sure you tune in. All right, guys, I'm going to go ahead and uh, close today out. And I appreciate all of you for showing up in your busy day. Thank you for supporting us. We really, truly appreciate it from the bottom of our hearts. And I hope to see you again next week. Until next time, happy caregiving. Bye.